Welcome back to Modern Malinois Podcast. Episode number two, we are going to be talking about what is drive. First off, though, we're going to clear up some confusion on our first episode. I realized, you know, when I posted that video on TikTok, had a lot of uh, lash. Or, it was you know. so controversial. Like, unex- yeah. I mean, not maybe not unexpectedly, but like, <laughs> there's so much hate <laughs> on it in a good way. I mean, it's cool because now you get to like clarify in a way and that's this is the venue for that so yeah i think one of the things i want to tell i wish i could tell people is like (sighs) there's stuff other than skinner's four quadrants (laughs) like you really need to look past quadrant theory like it's a great place to start but you know if that's what you're constantly thinking about in your training and that's like your only focus then you're, you're missing the boat on dog training like you really have to you know train the dog that's in front of you and you know sometimes i think it's important to think in a less uh, scientific way which is almost sounds like blasphemy it also sounds counter to what you'd normally say in a way like i feel like you're very direct with like your approach and science is kind of your mentality that way so it does sound a little odd (laughs) but you know when people are like oh well uh you know because one person was like um first off people don't know how to listen I didn't say I never use punishment. I said it shouldn't be used in the learning process, the learning process. Yeah. Um, And, you know, technically, yes, some things could be punishment, but, you know, we have to look at it from the dog's point of view. You know, somebody was like, uh, if I am teaching a place command and the dog gets off and I step in front of it, that's punishment. Right. I'm like, yes, technically, but like, you know, that's not what a lot of people are doing. And that's not, you know, that's a pretty, uh, I, I'm going after the low hanging fruits here. <laughs> right. Well, and I, mean, I felt like it was a little bit of a straw man. Um, and also, you know, if you're still teaching it and you're having to like get in the dog's face in the very beginning, that's not, you know, that's it, kind of what I was talking about. Like it's the learning process. You know, if I have a dog that knows what it's doing and I kind of stand in front of it, you know, like, is that really throwing it off you it's like yeah by psychological definitions that's punishment but come on now yeah a little bit different i mean it's it's like speaking a la- learning to speak a language and for you like you know shame on you for trying to adapt and uh, uh if the language is known having that kind of communication with punishment versus like you're starting to learn maybe a noun or a verb like Oh, shame on you for not knowing it immediately, right away, that moment, right? Yeah, and, uh, you know, I also want to clear up the idea of, like, the word punishment. Sure. Um, You know, I think that it's a bigger deal to be a better communicator sometimes and be slightly imprecise to allow the masses to know what we're talking about. Because when I was talking about that, you know, uh, people who um, are consider themselves to be professional dog trainers... And when I say professional, I don't necessarily mean they're good. I just mean they're getting paid for it. You know, they are probably not going to change their stance. You know, it's instead of getting better, it was just it's easier to shut the dog down. And so I was going after the general population. Most people don't know what the word correction means. And I, I am saying a correction and punishment is the same thing. I, I don't like to sugarcoat it. You know, in the first part, when we talked about, you know, if I give my dog an e-collar correction or punishment um for not outing in a specific situation it's not i'm not helping the dog or i'm not i'm excuse me i'm not you know making the dog feel better i'm not putting him into drive i'm not i'm using aversion right you know i think it's really important that i understand and i don't sugarcoat it what i'm doing to the dog And so it makes me a lot more careful about when I would ever use such a thing. It it just brings a level of just concise um, understanding between what you are doing with the dog and how the dog is perceiving you and what you're trying to achieve moving forward, really. Oh, yeah. No, totally. And um, I also, you know, I, I got a lot more hate on this post, and I just wanted to kind of say publicly... It's probably the most hate I've gotten in any post. And so a couple of people made, you know, comments or posts about uh, whether or not I will get as much hate as, you know, because I'm not the first one to say you shouldn't use punishment training, obviously. Um, 
And, you know, there's a lot of women and BIPOC creators on the app that have been saying that and have been a lot more vocal than I have. And yet they get tons of hate and tons of crap. And, you know, I totally recognize the fact of me being white. And also, even though I'm gay, I'm somewhat straight presenting. I know, you know, if you're in the know, obviously I don't present straight, but <laughs> there's a lot of people that I meet and that, you know, I have no idea. So, sure. you know, I can't really claim, you know, that, uh, that, you know, it's, it's a huge reason why I'm not getting as much hate. Yeah. Just being the representative of that voice and acknowledging like the power you hold behind it. I mean, is critical in its way and it's good to acknowledge it, especially in a space like this, um, because that, that was a large portion of what was being talked, like talked about is just like recognition of like the lack of hate that you would be receiving necessarily, which, you know, any kind of social media post or other, Hmm. you will just naturally receive less of that, partly because you're pretty good at what you do. (laughs) But I mean, also because, uh, your status, who you are, how you present. That's just the nature of the game, unfortunately, really. And something else I wanted to mention, it seemed like some people were confused about whether or not I could teach an out without the e-collar at all. Um, you know, if, if I was just doing sport, you know, if I was say, you know, wanting to do a protection sport, uh, I would have no problem having the out because I wouldn't have those, the same level of strenuous qualifications for the out. Um, and so that wouldn't wouldn't be an issue. I would easily be able to have them trade for things or, you know, work off of more food or downgrading versus having a dog who can just instantaneously out with 100 percent fluency, meaning they can do it anywhere at any time and stay just completely locked onto the decoy, ready to go at another moment's notice and not like kind of, you know, be looking around because I see that all the time. A dog will out off the decoy and then they're kind of like, you know, like glancing to the hands are like, what's next? Yeah. And it's like, I don't want that. No, no, because that's, you know, deviates from the threat, deviates from the thing it's supposed to be paying attention to the most. Right. That's mm-hmm. why bite, that's why bite work is bite work there. You're not, <laughs> you're not just biting random things. You're biting something you should be biting. Right. Mm-hmm. At, in its essence. And so therefore the thing being bitten should be uh, paid attention to. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right. I mean, <laughs> and then the last thing I wanted to address about the, the original one is, you know, some people were saying, oh, well, he's, you know, hey, this is just a marketing tactic. He really is a balanced trainer. And, uh, you know, as, if we, what most people are considering a balanced trainer, I wouldn't consider myself one. You know, if you really look at, because there's no real definition. If we look at uh, the definition of balance, I think what we're looking at is balance means in their proper amounts, not 50-50. Because, uh, I mean, there's one definition, but, you know, I think most people would say uh, the people who call themselves balanced would say it's in the proper. The people who call themselves force free would, you know, like to think it's 50 50. And so, uh, you know, I when I think of a, someone calling themselves a balanced trainer, you know, they're a lot more stressing the negative side or the punishment side. And, you know, years ago, that was me. But I'm always improving. I'm always evolving. You know, I'm never going to be the same trainer as I was even a month ago. I mean, I see myself doing stuff three, four months ago. I'm like, why did I do that? And 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 a year ago, I think some of my training was trash even a year ago. Like, and I'm just like, oh. And I hope that is. I hope 20 years from now, I look back 19 years from now, and I'm like, what was I doing? Not on all. You know, obviously, I hope some of the things I have are are ingrained, and I'm not changing. But I hope to always be improving and never slowing down anyone with kind of a you know teaching element to what they do um i know for you that's a piece of it um so that's you know you're never going to be the master like dunning kruger right you know you you have to always be improving you you never know enough you always need more and i think that's a huge part of what you do i know we we we've talked about that just between us at least but um for sure just learning and growing as a trainer and always looking back as a choice for improvement is Mm -hmm. I I think the way to go. Here's everything you need to know about drive. All right. So today's topic, (laughs) if you don't know, is drive. (laughs) Yeah. Drive. Such a misunderstood (laughs) word, a word that's just thrown around a lot. I think one of the biggest issues with it is that it doesn't have a real definition because it's not a scientific term. I mean, when I first met you, I 
full disclosure, had no, no, really no idea what you meant. Um, I had a co concept, um, just like what I would use to describe or associate with people in the word drive, but it's, it's a completely different thing. And this is like the absolute best space mm. for you to be able to kind of give your version of it. And I'm psyched to be able to be here to be part of that because uh, it really changed my perspective when it comes to dogs, observing them, seeing how they work with you, what they do. I mean, not just specifically you, but um, so I'm psyched for drive and all that. Yeah. Tell us about it. Drive. <laughs> drive. You know, when I think about, <clears throat> when I think about drive, I think one of the, you know, there's, there's two sets to it. I do think that some of the non-scientific um, kind of colloquial dog trainer talk has some merit. Sure. Um, but then I also think, you know, a lot of people miss out on the, I, the understanding the different phases of predation in wolves. Uh, they under, they miss out on really understanding what the dog is doing, what parts of drive that they are in, or what parts of the the the, the phase of predation that they are in. Um, you know, for me, it's also allegorical. You know, I think oh, that's not not an allegory. Wow. Talking to, the wrong, talking to the wrong person about allegories over here. <laughs> Alexandra is anything Alexandra does is allegorical. We'll just go ahead and call it allegorical. Okay. Um, so. The very first video I ever saw about Alex, um, you know, I always think a lot of people ask, how do you pick out a puppy? And the best advice that I can give them, and it's something that I learned from my mentor Nino at STS Canine, look for moments of greatness. Because no puppy is going to be on top all the time. They're puppies, and they're going to have ups and downs. They're going to have days where it's just like they're just yeah. total spazzes, and that's completely okay. But a regular puppy is never going to have that level of greatness where you see. And the first video I ever saw of Alex Alexandra, the guy who originally owned her was, was holding her by the collar. He threw her ball about 40, 50 feet away into a dark cave. And that's a long ways for, she was seven weeks old at the time. That's a long ways for a seven week old puppy. And she just was locked on. I mean, just like locked on and waited probably eight, 10 seconds, which is also a long time for a puppy to stay focused at seven weeks old. Let her go and she just pow, right at the cave. And she got to the edge of the cave, which you couldn't see from the, you couldn't see it inside, it was so dark. And she stopped because you know, it was like, I've never been inside a dark cave. I'm a seven week old puppy, I don't know what to do. Yeah. But she was driven to get that ball. She had to have it. And so she decided to face her fears and to go through any kind of obstacle that could be in her way, unknown or known, and she went and got that ball and came back. And I think that's just, to me, is one of the best examples of innate, you know, drive. Right. I mean, I love that story. Um, I love hearing it, especially because, like, I had the privilege of hearing it, like, early on into meeting Alex when I was meeting you. And kind of a continuance of that is seeing her do what she does and do it on a regular basis. The innate part of that has continued to be a thread throughout her entire existence with you as a dog working, as a dog biting, as a dog doing all kinds of things that she is doing, which is all the more important for choosing mm. a dog to be doing this kind of work and to truly understand it as a facet for why you would be choosing and working with the dogs that you do. I mean, honestly, like, I, I've never met a dog of my own, not that I've ever worked with dogs of this caliber, but I've never had a dog that would have ever done any of that. Like to truly understand a dog losing sight, not being distracted, only being interested, locking on, not being deterred by darkness, by the unknown and going and coming back. That's insane. And only seven it's weeks ins old. It's insane to me. <laughs> and that's, I mean, I feel like moment of greatness doesn't even do it justice, uh, truly, because that's a moment of like a uh, superhero. I mean, it's, like, it's on another level, really, truly. It's obvious. I mean, it's an obvious reason why you chose the the girl, the thing. So I saw that video and I was just like, I have to have this <laughs> have puppy. Have ever. I mean, I will do whatever it takes to have this yeah. puppy. She just and she hasn't disappointed since. I mean, she's got the speed. She's got the food drive. You know, she's super lovable, but she can turn it on and off. Yeah. Like, she is just... She's a monster. She's the entire package. She is. Yep. Total she, catch. 
I'm kind of surprised we haven't heard her whining because they're downstairs <laughs> they're right downstairs. now. And uh, she, you know, her being in, she's in, you know, mega heat right now. Yeah. Poor thing. Poor thing. Um, yeah. And so uh, just as a little side note, the way I deal with my dogs in heat um, is I give them way more attention. They get to come out two to three times more, hang out two to three times more. Uh, we're not doing, you know, a lot of training, but we're doing a lot of snuggling, a lot of letting them outside and just, you know, get that, you know, frantic energy yeah. out, um, to sniff, run around, and then come inside and just get tons and tons and tons of snuggles. Yeah, and I mean, today is such a, like, it's like a cozy September day. It's not, it almost feels fall-like. We're like kind of in a cloud here, which is weird for the desert but uh she's just out running around smelling all the smells being happy and you know not doing any particular training but have just generally getting all that energy out and having a good time mm -hmm. so yeah i'm surprised she's not whining though too <laughs> yeah i'm this whole time I, I i meant to shut the door oh yeah but you know she's thang so yeah, she, she'll be all right she's doing good she'll be all right um so back to drive um so it's not a scientific term, but, you know, we can think about it in, you know, we talk about, we talk about mostly prey drive. And so when a dog is in prey drive, they are still thinking with their, their frontal lobe. They're not in the limbic system. They're not in fight or flight. Um, it's something that they are enjoying. They're not doing it out of anger, out of fear. They are, you know, ready and engaged. Um, and you have the first is that orient eye, you know, where you're, the dog is, has identified that there's some sort of prey that they want and they orient their body and they, and they stare. Um, you have a dog, then they're going to go into, they stalk, which chase. And then we have a grab bite, a kill bite, a dissect and consume. And over the years, different dogs, different breeds have been bred to have more or less of those particular pieces of the predation cycle. So, I have never once seen any of my dogs ever stalk. They don't stalk, ever. Whereas you have a border collie, and that is like that's their life. They have the eye, <laughs> the, eye the eye, and the stalk, and the stalk, and the chase. Yep, is that's their, their life. life. But then they get to the they get to the livestock, and they're not. There's no grab bite or kill bite. Mm -mm. You know, those have been. You know, it's possible to have a dog from any litter that doesn't have the same levels of the particular parts of the predation phase or phase i keep wanting to call it a cycle for some reason but it's not a cycle because it doesn't rotate uh, after they consume they also then orient and uh, yes eye and then stalk again yes yes i, I don't know I, circle of life yes the circle of, all right i don't need to sing on this podcast um <laughs> this is not the time no or the place i hate that yeah hate, like one of my favorite tw yeah all right i digress um, and so, you know, the, the dogs that I'm dealing with are, you know, very heavily, I very heavily orient and I, um, chase. And then what we were really hoping to have is kill bite, almost even dumb down the grab bite. Yeah. The grab bite is more associated with pulling. It's more associated with, you know, trying to take a chunk having that initial grab, but it's not initial, it's not, uh, it's not associated with the ultra power. So like, would you say in a way, I know this might be a totally off base question, just redirect me if it's wrong. Um, but like, I know with the distinction with the different kinds of bite work that we do and the kinds of dogs that you're looking for in particular, would you say that that portion of the predation non-cycle? <laughs> the grab bite is something that is something that's bred for in like like the dogs that are that that aspect of the drive or do you feel yeah, like so it's... we're we're, we're kind of getting into muddy waters yeah, we're getting into really yeah no i mean yeah. i just say that because we're getting into guess waters yeah and you know my 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 background in data analysis i really hate i really hate making generalizations yeah. on uh, poor evidence totally and by poor evidence i just mean you know a hundred percent either um observational or just extrapolatory and in this case it's somewhat subjective because there's not much to it i was just curious if I mean, i'm not going to ask for an opinion because yeah, so it's... whether or not they're actually yeah. are, are bred or have more of the grabber kill 
I don't know, but mm -hmm. we definitely uh, we work to express more of it. I do think that there are dogs who have more that kill bite because, you know, the MVPK dogs um, that I have are bred to have that push bite because of how the Belgian ring sport is. Totally. Whereas, you know, uh, KMPV or, you know, other lines of mouths, they don't have that same bite genetics that you mm -hmm. would find in the MVPK. And so, you know, I think that's one of the reasons that they bite so much better is in their mindset they it's they're not grab bites mm -hmm. they are kill bites right and so you know they're not like they're not pushing back um and you see a lot of you know with bite sports they come in they do a long a long attack and the dog bites you know they the spin, spin around yeah you know to to use up the momentum and then the dog never really ever seems to go into a kill bite mm -hmm. they just kind of the shake thrash and pull. you know pull yeah. you know maybe do more grab yeah and um i mean that's one of the things we work directly against like if uh any of the dogs re-grip on me or try to like change the i take my leg away or i'll take my you know mm. they don't get to have that <laughs> they don't get to you know you don't get to you get one bite mm -hmm. <laughs> you get one <laughs> you better you better hang on you better push into me you better go for it so um, but it's interesting too, cause I think an aspect of this is the strike, you know, when the dogs come in for that bite, mm -hmm. which is totally different from a lot of videos I'll watch or observe and just like how they come at me, how they strike and how they get that first intense bite is so different. But I mean, props to the dogs and to how they're trained and how they work and what they want. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and it is two different things though. If you have a, a sport dog. That, you know and you're wanting to compete there's no real reason to you know to, to really ha you know say if you're wanting to compete in mondial ring it's it's a it's fun to have a dog who has a more of a full uh penetrating bite but it's not going to win you any more points so in a way it's a waste of time for those competitors um and so it's not you know it's like it's not necessarily a bad thing it's like you know it's like taekwondo it's it's really cool it has you know some amazing artistic value but you're not going to use it in the street. <laughs> right. No, for sure. And so, um, but getting back to the, to the, the, so the drive, you know, to me, the, how this, how the predation phases kind of intersect with drive is to me, drive is intensity over time with how willing they are to engage in one or more of the phases of, of predation. Um, and so, you know, excuse me. You know, I think of a dog who has high drive as a dog who I say intensity over time because it's not just a dog who can like go frantic and oh my god lose their mind or people will be like watch my dog he just chases really hard after the ball mm -hmm. so he's high drive or you know he leaps really hard at the ball so he's high drive and to me wanting it bad is not high drive um, it's part of it it's necessary but it's yeah. not a sufficient condition um, going back to my math background there um, sufficient conditions. Yep, yeah, necessary versus sufficient <laughs> conditions. So it's necessary, but it's not sufficient to have high drive. To me, a dog who has a high drive means that they want it really badly, yes, but also they are willing to go through adversity to get it and over amount of time and degrees of, of adversity. You know, so a dog who has high drive, you know, for instance, I one time threw, I was playing with Ulrich when we were in Nashville, we were playing frisbee, and uh, he was just he his. I don't know. It was hot. He was tired, and so his self control was starting to go down. So I ended our session because I didn't want to continue with that. And uh, I thought he wasn't looking, and I didn't want to carry the, the the frisbee in with me because um, he just was losing it. And you know it was hot. I totally understood it because he's normally on it. So I threw it. I threw the frisbee over the the house. And Ulrich saw it, and he was trying to climb the house. He was trying to climb the wall. I mean, it was, a, you know, there's no way he was going to get over it because it was gigantic. I mean, you know, he'd have to he'd have to go up, you know, 12 feet and then climb the, the ease or whatever the that soffit would not, or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I don't that know. That wouldn't stop houses. him though. If he could, he, <laughs> if he could have done it. He, he was trying. Done it, yeah. He was trying. Yeah. And for a month or two after that, I would let him out of the house, and he was still wanting to. Yeah. In his mind, it was still, still he there. could get that. Yeah. And that to me is, you know, part of drive yeah. um, or, you know, having a dog, you know, where uh, uh, 
we hadn't been training a lot of public lately because of the heat and the fire smoke, just keep, stay at home. And so I took Ulrich to, uh, to Lowe's and, um, we were training kind of off in the, you know, area where people couldn't see us and I had food and we were doing some good training with food. And then he kind of got, you know, he was getting kind of tired and he's like, kind of getting a little, you know, like what's going on. I haven't been out in public for a while. So, but then all of a sudden I brought out his ball and just new dog all of a sudden, like, it was like he was back at home. It didn't matter what was going on, where we were, who we were with. Yeah. He was locked in. He was focused, and he was ready. Um, and all the, all the adversity that he was having to overcome, that he was starting to, you know, because he was getting full, not full because I wasn't feeding a lot, but he was getting to the point where, like, all right, I've had a ton of treats now. Like It, like, reaches the balance of the scale, right? It's like, well, I get it, and I'm all right. Like, sure, I'll do this for you, but... <laughs> yes. Not that his like food drive isn't good, but for him, he, he balances out, but the ball is a whole nother. Oh. It's a whole new playing field. <laughs> well, and to think too, you know, when we think about drive, dogs are always seeking to alleviate. They're not alleviate. They're always seeking to fulfill that drive. Sure. So, you know, the, the goal, you know, for them, obviously it's to get, you know, to go out and kill things, get food and be able to alleviate the hunger and the need to, to consume prey. Um, and so once you've had food for a while, it's like, well, I don't really need to be, you know, they're, they're alleviating that drive. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, but we just all of a sudden, you know, so he decided that the adversity that he was having to, would have to go f through to get that food wasn't as worth it as it was in the beginning. Right. He'll still go through the motions, but he'll look a little flat. And but then the ball comes out, and holy moly, he's no longer flat. He is jacked. Oh yeah, I mean anytime. <laughs> and you know, I know you see this some of the time, uh, but with your your vest, you have your ball usually sitting right at your back, and he loves he loves just like coming around <laughs> the side of you and just like grabbing it for a second and then letting it go and looking and seeing if you saw you know like <laughs> he loves that like he knows it's there <laughs> he's like mm. uh, can i get it <laughs> and that's and that's another you know a good point with dogs who you know have the levels of drive is you're always seeking to have enough control but a dog like that it's almost a good sign when you have a dog who every once in a while takes cheap shots their out starts to break down because if, if I'm not having issues with my dog, then it's like, well, how bad do they really want it? If they're not willing to break the rules sometimes to yeah. try and get it. Which is another thing I, like I admire about you, honestly, is like uh, very early, I would say like first or second time I met you, you said that um, one of your goals was uh, never to break a dog's spirit, mm. like for who, for who the dog is in its nature and how it is. And I think a lot of that goes into you choosing dogs that are correct for the work that aligns a lot with drive. That's, you know, they, they have the drive to be able to do the things mm -hmm. and they need to do the things, but like, you'll never diminish a dog's spirit. Like all Rick's spirit is something that's first of all, uncrushable, <laughs> but <laughs> like totally you can't destroy. But second of all, like he will take cheap shots. He will see how we can do it because he wants to do it and he wants mm -hmm. to alleviate that level of um need right and for you like that's that's your relationship with him that's not eliminating that respecting him and appreciating that he's going to do those things and he will do them he will do those yes. things and it's know? not just a matter of you know something we'll get into here in a minute it's not just a matter of arousal you know he's not like he's just all of a sudden not thinking clearly you know all playing chess and he's you know he's not playing checkers and so he's trying to figure you know like uh, everyone's like, oh, he just loves obeying you. No, he does not. He loves his ball. <laughs> he loves to bite. Yeah. But I've, no. you know, but he knows that he gets to have that the best and the and you know and the in the most enjoyable way through working and through me. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that he's not always trying to figure out ways to get that. He loves on his trying terms. to game the system a little bit all the time. I love that about him. No, though. for sure. I love that about him too. It's what makes him so good at what he does. It's also the reason why, like, you know, totally separately. I know we've done a couple, like, you know, we'll take a video or something like that, and like, he'll stand there for like a take or two, and he's like, "What the heck?" <laughs> he gets so like, <sighs> he's ready. I want to bite please let me bite now's the time and then he like goes full full sand on the bite like he just 
you know, he's going to, he, if he can do it, he will do it and he will mm-hmm. do it his way. Like Ulrich, you know, that's his spirit. That's his nature. And that's why I love him. No. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons that we call him Poop Pop. No, yeah. He is Poop Pop. He is. But with arousal, I mean, he's, he's separate from that in that aspect. And mm-hmm. I know you're, you're going to talk about that. And I think it's really key because so many dogs do are just experiencing that kind of like high arousal state. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Something else that I wanted to mention is that uh, you can have, you know, uh, and this, I hope, gives, if there's any pet owners out there watching this, kind of makes them maybe feel a little better. Just because I have very extreme drive dogs, they would chase and go after anything. And yet... I don't really have a whole lot of issues calling them off of livestock or not livestock, but you know, we live on 40 acres. We have animals out here, deer, we have bobcats, rattlesnakes, you know, all kinds of stuff. And, uh, we regularly are out on the property. I don't have, there's no collars on them. You know, we're walking the property and I've had to call my dogs off of deer multiple times out here. Um, and it's not a huge issue for them because one, I have built the idea that, you know, what I have is the ultimate, but also, you know, their stalking and just chasing isn't their highest priority. So if people have different breeds where that could be the case and they're having issues with their recall, don't feel, excuse me, don't feel bad because Or or think that, oh, well, you know, Matt's doing it. Why can't I do it? And his dogs are even higher drive. And it's, it's like, well, yeah, but they're, they're not what they find most enjoyable or what they're most driven to do in that cycle cycle. Wow. In the (laughs) phases of predation, I'm not going to be able to stop saying that. Um, uh, Isn't the same thing that drives every other dog. Right. No. So. Not at all. I wanted to, I wanted to mention that just because, you know, there are certain things that it's actually easier to do with my Malinois, even though they're, you know, so much dry, but there's also certain things that are harder to do. Um, there's no need to get discouraged about it, right? It's just, and I personally put drive in four categories, low, medium, high, and extreme. Yeah. Uh, I've seen very few extreme drive dogs. Most people's dogs, I would really consider them medium drive. Even most working dogs that I see, um, they just look kind of flat to me and they're like, look at this high drive dog. Look at them working this high drive dog. And I'm like, eh, not really. Um, but, you know, I would put, I would put Ulrich, Ulrich, Alexandra and, and, and Magnus in extreme and Kaladin would be on, would be high, you know, maybe low high. Low high. Low high to give, just to give people an example. Um, you know, another thing that I wanted to bring up was the idea of building drive. This is something that I've been kind of pondering for a long time, reading about, trying to clear up my opinion on whether or not I think drive can be built. And I, I think that it cannot. I think it can be expressed. I think the dogs, you know, I think with the, I think the natural ability of the dog, um, their levels of drive are what they're born with. And by that, I mean, you know, you are never going to have a dog who is say you would consider medium drive. You're having issues with, you're never going to be able to take them up to what Alexandra could do. Never. It doesn't matter how good of a trainer you are. I know she's your thing. I know. It's the same thing. You know, uh, you take, Tiger Woods at three years old was on with the tonight show hitting golf balls. Um, yes, his dad pushed him and, you know, put him through a lot to be able to do that. But you put another three year old, you put a thousand other three year olds with his dad and give him the exact same experience. They're not going to be on the tonight show hitting golf balls no matter what. Yeah, it's true. You know, and, and it's not that they maybe not have, you know, just, they don't have that they don't have that desire they don't have that inner thing that just motivates them and pushes them that drives them <laughs> drives oh, them please don't hate me later. i was trying I'm not so to sorry. use that word <laughs> <laughs> i knew you, like i could see it in your eyeballs you were like just don't just don't don't say it don't say it don't say it 
<laughs> and I was like, I'm just going to do it. So yeah, what drives them, what, you know, it, it's truly, I mean, it's an inner, inner force, inner, you know, peace. Now, with that being said, I do think that needs rehearsal. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have a dog that comes out and they are, you know, some dogs will have an amazing food drive as a puppy, but they have almost no prey drive because they have not rehearsed that. And so the chemicals that release in their brain to make them excited and to make them enjoy that experience have not been ingrained much yet. So that does need, you know, that needs to happen. But as far as, you know, what is possible, you know, I think it's really about you know, expressing what the dog has, giving them the confidence and the background, the rehearsal to um, show you what they what they have. Totally. I think I can get behind that for sure. The next thing I wanted to bring up is the word arousal. So many people get arousal levels and drive levels conflated. And you see a dog that's their teeth are chattering, they're shaking. You know, to me, that doesn't necessarily mean that the dog is high drive. Um, a dog that's high in arousal, I think is not good for the most part because they can make poor decisions. You know, that's where they start to kind of slip between the frontal lobe thinking and the limbic system of like fight or flight or like the stress starts to take over and they're no longer engaging in... Uh, the predation phases because of what they're, they, but just because of what they want to do, what they enjoy, um, they're all of a sudden, you know, there's a stress aspect to it. And, you know, so many people think that they have a high drive dog when they really just have a high anxiety, high arousal dog. Um, and so I think that's a huge, 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 huge misconception um you know sometimes and any of these dogs can any of my dogs their arousal levels can go up but luckily it's not all the time and when it does i am going to work to bring those levels down because i want the arousal level down but i want the drive high because i want the dog to be able to think straight and make good choices but not just be like you know almost like an addict yeah you know where and they are and it's make... totally funny that you say that because it's exactly what I think of when I see the like the shattering look. It's just this addiction, this need, mm. this like I you know I have to have this happen right now or else I'm gonna break into a million pieces. Like, <laughs> and it's like it's what it looks like. It's what it feels like, and mm -hmm. um, it's that cool, calm, and collected. Like Ulrich is full on and shuts off. He's done and he's ready to engage and he is engaged and he's locked on and he's that's all. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no like hype to that. There's only like this intensity that you feel like wafting off of him. And I think it's I think another good ex you know example is to bring up um, the the ADHD neurodivergent brain. You know I think it's a great way for humans to kind of relate. Um, you know put that put them in a stressful situation. They get more calm and more focused. Yeah. You know, as you've experienced ton times and times again in your yeah. work, sure. you know, it's like uh, something goes wrong in your daily life and it's just like the end of the world. Somebody in front of you is literally falling to pieces, literally falling to pieces. Oh. And it's just like, boom, 100% yeah. focus. I mean, and, and calm. Yeah. It's certainly, like, I think, uh, you know, I'm not going to make generalizations about my job, but I definitely feel like there's a big draw for people like particularly mm. like me who have you know as i've been once told by a psychiatrist like off the charts adhd <laughs> um yeah i think you know there's a big draw to that i think um that's i mean it's probably also why i'm a, you know at least halfway decent decoy and able to engage with you and work with you in the sim a similar way like just neurodiver neurodivergent mm. people in general um and just being able to focus in and like not lose sight of what's needed. Maybe your dogs are ADHD. <laughs> no, I'm just maybe. I'm sorry. Maybe maybe your dog maybe high drive dogs are ADHD. <laughs> and neurodivergence in some dogs I don't know anything about, but um, it's, this is the start. This, it wouldn't surprise. I mean, honestly, I mean, it wouldn't surprise. We me. are we are ADHD. The high drive dogs. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, but that's, you know, that's exactly what I want. I want a yeah. dog where the more we put on them, the more focus they get right. and the more in a way calm they get because they know, okay, this is what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, I'm in my element. That's my speed. That's, that's why like, you know, I feel like all the people I work with are very much in the same light. And I know you've, you've met with several of them who've kind of mm -hmm. confirmed the same, like we're all kind of part of that, you know, massive like ADHD intense, our focus and intensity gets so much more when we're in situations of chaos or like in like overwhelm that doesn't that that that's our that's our base and that's our calm place that's where we make our best decisions mm -hmm. maybe that's where the kill bite is i don't know <laughs> i mean i go out you know a lot of i mean excuse me me personally i think i'm gonna have to stop drinking carbonated beverages on these podcasts you're, uh, you're struggling with them i really am <laughs> uh but you know it's funny a lot of people think of me like when I go out, say to the stores that I frequent or people that I've gotten to know um, around here and they think I'm just like this really calm, relaxed person. So relaxed. And, uh, and it's like, no, I just, I'm calm in these situations, but like I'm laser intensity when it comes to being with my dogs and, yeah. and training them. <laughs> um, and I, I, one, I like to see, you know, and I, I save it for them. I don't want to I mean, why do I need to be? You don't need on to it expend it. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're able to like go to a low key mm -hmm. version of, and you're not expending energy that you're going to need later to allocate for certain things. Definitely. Right? Yeah. The last topic I wanted to bring up, which is big for me, and I think um, probably going to be the most controversial. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. Is uh, the idea of having a dog in defense drive versus prey drive? Uh, as like we said beforehand, when a dog is in prey drive, meaning that they are engaging in one or more of the predation, not cycle. Mm. <laughs> cycle. Cycle. <laughs> linear. Yes. Think very linear. <laughs> Beginning and end. Indeed. When they're engaging in one or more of the phases of predation, they are not doing so from a place of anger, from a place of stress. You know, it is something that they love to do and it, in a way is, is de-stressing. And so they're still thinking with their, their frontal lobe, place where they can make good decisions. A dog who is in defense drive, for me, by definition, they are in fight or flight. They are now thinking with the limbic system. They are now thinking, you know, with that base, you know, fight, flight, freeze, fawn, or... Wait, I know there's a fifth one. Fight, flight, freeze, fawn. What's the fifth one? I only ever knew four, so. If you come up with a fifth one right now, that'd be great. Oh, well, I don't know. Let's, move, let's just keep going. You're gonna, is it eating at you right now? There's a fifth one, yeah. I, I've only seen four. Oh, well. But when they're in that, uh, they're now, one, they're acting from a place of stress. They can't make good decisions. They are, you know, no longer able to be trained to the level of, I think, what a even, a, even just a sport bike work dog should be doing. And so that's one of the reasons you don't, I never do any kind of agitation work. Um, especially, I don't, you know, a lot of people make, they're like, oh, well, this is just the way it's done. And it's like, what the Excuse me. I'm not, maybe I should bleep that one out. But I'm just like, Beep. what the f are you doing to your dog? Why do you have it on a prong collar and have it lunge out and doing agitation work? Well, that's how we do it in this sport. It doesn't make it okay. This appeal to tradition, like that, is a complete logical fallacy, as we know. Like, stop it, stop it, stop it. That's the way we've always done it, Matt. It's and the way we've always, always done, done it, it, Matt. That's how it's gonna be. It's like, you know, if you don't know what logical fallacies are, it's like when your mom's like, oh, well, we cook. We only we always cut the ends off the ham. Well, why? Oh, that's how my grandmother did it. Oh, it's because she had her her pan was too damn small and she couldn't afford a bigger pan. So she had to cut the ends off. In Therefore, order to cook now it. we do the same. Yeah, correct. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't ever train my dogs in defense drive because one, I don't want to stress out Two, I want them to have great thinking skills, decision-making skills, problem-making skills. Um, I don't want them to shut down and think that they're 
only options are fight, flies, fr- fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, and the mystery fifth one. <laughs> <laughs> mystery flavor. <laughs> the mystery flavor. Um, and so it's just, it's something that I never do. And the reason I think most people are doing it is also multifold. First, I think most people do not have access to amazing dogs. They, I was going to say, is it a mask for a dog that doesn't have high drive? Is that your feeling? 100%. Yeah. That's what I was kind of wondering if you were going to get there and maybe I just jumped the gun on you and I apologize if I did. Um, I think kind of a cool example of a video you have that I was part of was the one with Alex being really hyped up to bite and you saying she's one of the only dogs that you actually have to calm before a bite. And I think that's, that's part of that logic for you. And that's part of that. Like, we don't need this as part of what we're Mm. doing. We need her to be in a place where she's not in any of the five mystery flavor included (laughs) modes for fight or flight no limbic system activation like very lower you know much lower much more like focused intent Mm. right like that's i think that's a good example of you kind of you know engaging with that with her in particular at least it just as a point of clarity i would say it would uh only puppies that I would need to calm down yes. because puppies just generally like trying to excite, excite them and them get to them do hyped things, yeah. um, because they're, they're not quite sure what's happening yet. And so, uh, but yeah, she, as far as puppies go, she's one of the only puppies I've ever seen that really needed to be brought down. Brought, yeah. brought down. And I had to put a lot more control on her in the beginning um, because I knew it would, one, it wouldn't shut her down. She wouldn't she like, doesn't care. become disinterested. No, no. You wouldn't be able to take that from her. No, but a dog like her, if if I didn't if I didn't get it through her head that she's not allowed to to whine and vocalize before the bite, she would never stop. No, ever. I'd have to, you know, like if you were forced to do, you'd have, you'd be forced to do something drastic, which would be, you know, counter. It would be, you know, hurtful to the dog. Yeah, and it would ruin your like a part of your guy's relationship. Honestly, like that dynamic you have is trust built over time, and I think knowing that you could eliminate something before it could be harmful and detrimental to your engagement with her mm-hmm. it's just to your benefit like you, you don't hurt someone after making a mistake you know i know you're always looking for your your mistakes so you don't worry about the dog and how they will engage with you right oh yeah yeah, yeah and so you know we have these dogs who should never be doing bite work or they can't bite well unless they're fe- fearing for their life right. and their fight or flight mode um, and you know, that people are either, you know, have to sell them. So they're making it happen no matter what, or, you know, maybe they just don't know any better and they are, you know, putting the dogs in these situations. Uh, the, the, the pushback that I often get is, well, we're doing real bite work. We're doing real personal protection, you know? And so they need to be able to get into that mindset. Uh, and you know, my, my retort is, you know, if, if your dog can't bite well and can't do its job without getting in that mindset, then you've got a crappy dog. I'm sorry. Like, that's you do. Yeah. Like, Auric is biting like his, like, he's biting like his life depends on it. He's biting like my life depends on it. He's biting like the decoy's life depends on it, even though he's trying to kill them. But, I mean, like, he's biting like the world depends on it. And it's all for funsies. It is all for funsies, especially for Poop Pop. <laughs> you know, I mean, we have a dog who... This is freaking thick. Like, like this is so hard, and yet we have a dog that can bruise through this, through this. I mean, this is a full-on thick Mondio ring suit, added jute shell, and then it's got this hardness inside as well. And Auric is putting bruises on through that. You know what? I'm proud of you for making that stay in one shot. I was, I, I actually, <laughs> I decided that if it fell, I wasn't going to pick it up. Gonna I was just going to ignore it. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think just kind of in a similar vein, this is probably true for other professions other than like fire and EMS, but uh, we work around that fight or flight a lot with our own training, like going into a burning building is very exciting (laughs) and very engaging and like it's you know it's that feeling of oh you know there's an alarm and i have Mm. to go and my system is all activated but because of all the training we do before we don't want to be in that space Mm. because our decision making is impaired and so um 
we have a this is dumb and i don't you know i'm I'm a firefighter but like you know train like you want to fight the fire Mm -hmm. and that's what our the phrase is train like you want to be fighting the fire and they train how you actually perform and so that makes it so that if we're in that situation of fight flight fawn or freeze and mystery (laughs) um we can actually just go back to our training defer to it reflect on it and not be in that mode Mm. and that's so critical to what we do and it's you know it's not the same as being a dog but i feel like it's a good reflection of a very similar sort of thing for like true success at what we do being able to go in and put the fire out to be able to go and do cpr like those things we are able to go back and re- reflect on what we do and go back to something that's base and not fight or flight and performative if we know this it is mm-hmm. one two three this is what we do and we do it correctly because we have to just like the yeah. dog right and i'm See. sure you can attest that there are plenty of people there are many people who try to become firefighter paramedics or just firefighters or just paramedics and can't because they cannot handle those such stressful situations even though they want to yeah and i i think you know in a way that career kind of weeds that out um whether you know i i think a lot of people are passionate about it and that makes me happy i'll always i'm always going to support anyone who's who love i love what i do um, I'll support anyone who's interested in it, but it is not for everyone. And it's just not for every, it, bite work is not for every dog. Mm-hmm. Firefighting is not for every person, right? I am a dog, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I, I, you know, for me, I think watching Ulrich in particular, not that the other dogs are any different but he is doing it for funsies and he's doing it because it's a reflection of his training and what he knows and he is bruising through that he's a nutcase it's i love it i love it too (laughs) in a weird way i guess but like he's amazing and the fact that he is able to do that and be so nonchalant (laughs) Mm -hmm. um is um i know you don't like giving yourself too much kudos or too much credit but it's a testament to you, your skill, and your continued um, interest in educating yourself, you know, for the cycle of predation and all of the above, right? Like, it's it's um, kind of a testament to that and the skill of the dog and what it, what what Poopops is able to do, right? Poopop. 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 <laughs> Yeah. He is poop up. He is the one. He is poop up. Yeah. No, it's, you know, and so there is so much more quantity demanded than there is quantity supplied. Totally. I was trying to remember my econ professor would get mad at me if I said there's more supply than, or the more more demand than supply, because that's not how it works. But um, then there are, you know, there's way more dogs that are needed to be personal protection dogs and there are actual dogs who are able to do the work. Um, you know, I think another, another issue is that a lot of the dogs coming over, uh, that are being bred should have never done the work. So it's just, it's a, you know, it's a reinforcing cycle of, you know, people think they know what a great dog looks like, what a dog who's bred and meant to do the work looks like. But they've only ever seen a dog who's just what you know. They think right. this dog's wild. And then and... there's expectation of product based on history mm-hmm. of like what is has been observed, right? Even though that's not what a truly great thing is, you just have scarcity. And what's coming over to America isn't that great, you know. When you see the dogs that are being sent over from breeders in Belgium and Holland, like they're not sending their top dogs. Their top dogs are staying right there in Belgium to either be bred or you know to work there, like or given given to a friend, like. None of, none of the police officers, none of the, I mean, like you would be shocked at what even like the special forces has. Like it's crazy. It's, it's like, how is this even possible? <laughs> like I, I, it's, it's, it's shocked. I mean, um, you know, and as you've seen, we, I can take all work around other people. Like I'm not worried. I could take him around, you know, kids. I think we're going to be doing, um, you know, pretty soon some demos in schools, and I'm not worried about that in the absolute slightest. No, I had him at, uh, you know, your firehouse. Yeah, and we did a demo. Yeah, and like, you know, Ulrich, Magnus, they were both fine. You know, no, they were walk having, around. They were having a good time. Get rubbed on, yeah. hanging out, hanging out with the fire guys. They're having fun. 
It, I wouldn't have any worry about they're, the dogs. Yeah, I always tell people, you know, a good. A, they're like the guy that's in the bar who is a professional fighter. He's the last guy that's going to start a fight because he has nothing to prove. Yeah. <laughs> He's not intimidated or threatened, mm -mm. you know? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I think that's probably it a good... It kind of covers, uh, covers drive for the most part. I'm sure you're going to get at least like maybe one or two questions <laughs> in the mix. Yeah, yeah. If you guys have questions, put them in the comments. Uh, let us know um, anything that we didn't cover. You know, we kind of rambled a bit. So if anything wasn't clear or we didn't get to it um, and you want to hear us talk, clear up. Maybe we'll keep the beginning of the podcast for just kind of clearing stuff up. Yeah. But just like a reflection on like commentary and stuff like that. I feel like that's that's fair. Yeah. I think if, if there was one thing we maybe didn't go into a whole lot, uh, kind of got sidetracked talking about um, adversity and what the dogs are willing to go through to get what they need. But I think in a way that's kind of somewhat self-explanatory. I mean, you know, I could take all work. It doesn't matter if it's snowing. It doesn't matter if it's raining. You know, even you know any of them, like they're still going to be excited to work. You know, they're not going to be like, oh, or I put them on a slick floor. They're no longer like, oh, we don't want to bite the person because I, I can't get good purchase with my paws. Um, or, you know, uh, you know, another good example is, you know, like me, I have a, that one video where it's like, can your canine stay target focused while being hit by a leaf blower? Mm -hmm. And he's just like on it. Yeah. And he's like, well, this is what I got to do to get my, my prey. Yeah. This is what I got to do. Totally. hundred percent. And, 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 you know, in time as well, how he can go on and off train for an extended period of time. Um, I mean, how long were we at the firehouse or like, oh, probably an hour, an hour. And yeah. he was, I mean, still good to go. He was good to yeah. go the entire time. And we were constantly not like, you know, so we I had some times where you kind of little decompress, ride him on the leash where he could kind of walk around, but we were going in and out of heels in and out of like doing ball training because different people were showing up and, you know, I wanted to give them all a little bit of taste of what, of what the poop up could do. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And so, yeah, I'm glad we got to do podcast number two. Number I appreciate two. you being back with us. Of course. Of course. Anytime. It's always fun. The wonderful and lovely <laughs> Annie, everyone. Aw, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And that's it. That's the podcast. That's the podcast. Cheers, all guys. Right. Cheers. I just want to see how long it could make you stare. <laughs> I was staring at you for like half of it. <laughs> there she is. Mm. There she is. She knows we're done. See how amazing she is? She waited till the very, she waited till we were done with the podcast to, to she whine. Did. And she was like, okay, it's me now. That's what you get with a modern Malinois dog. Now we're really going to end it. Cheers. <laughs>